Um, the decal, this is probably the most controversial of it all because people got charged for this. This is what funds the base of the program. Um, we enacted this, Endow enacted this uh, a year ago, 2013. It basically requires motorized and non -motor most non-motorized watercraft to have an annual decal. Uh, the decal's up there in the corner. Uh, one's non-motorized, one is residents, one is for non-residents. The prices, like for a kayak, things like that, or resident is $5. Uh, Non-residents, non-motorized watercraft, such as a kayak that re can retain water, is $10. Motorized watercraft are $10 for a resident. Non-resident is $20. So this is an annual fee if you, you use, you know, watercraft. Not, not all watercraft, there are some exceptions. The exceptions are water toys, beach toys, uh, inner tubes, air mattresses, water skis, paddle boards are exempt because paddle boards, for the most part, do not retain water. Things like canoes are required. Uh, most of your kayaks, you can see this kayak right here in the right-hand corner, has a, a compartment that holds water. So that would be required to have an AIS decal present on it. If you take it in any waters in Nevada, unless it's tribal land, you don't have to have it. Uh, what is the decal program fund? Uh, this is one of our most common questions. Uh, it is funding, for, <laughs> it is funding uh, surface water monitoring, primarily for quad muscles. However, it's more recently uh, New Zealand mud snails in some reaches. Uh, law enforcement or for game wardens to enforce the AIS decal laws. Uh, inspection and decontamination stations. Uh, those are primarily funded by federal grants. The decal does not bring in enough funding for all of this stuff. So it's highly supplemented with federal grants from primarily U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. And it also funds outreach efforts. As you can see, this is a billboard uh, that was on Interstate 80 last year for the clean drain and dry message. And we do things like produce the brochure, don't move a muscle, which is in the back, which informs the public about aquatic invasive species. Now, it also funds monitoring, as I mentioned. This is the type of, um, this is actually monitoring for quagga mussels. Um, Endow does that pretty much statewide. It, it reservoirs that the public uses with watercraft. And um, people like uh, Bureau of Reclamation also do it on their reservoirs on a monthly basis during the summer primarily. And just to give you an idea of what we're looking at, these are called villagers of quagga mussels. They're uh, microscopic, you can't see them. Um, they basically take water samples and these are put under um, highly uh, polarized microscopes that are special, very specialized to even find this. Um, this is an example of an in-down employee putting in a plankton net to uh, grab a water sample to send to the lab. So we actually pay laboratories to analyze these because we, of course, don't have the equipment to go to this detail. Uh, currently, uh, now what we're measuring for primarily are villagers, but when they're out there, the, the biologists will look around the docks and check you know, other areas to see if they find any adult mussels. Uh, so far in northern Nevada, no adult Quagga mussels have been found in northern Nevada. Now, we did have a scare a couple of years ago in 2011 at Lahontan and Rye Patch where the villagers, these microscopic um, critters were found. Uh, those were Bureau of Reclamation samples that, that they identified them. Uh, since that time, Endow has gone out. We have not been able to repeat those samples. Um, Bureau of Reclamation samples monthly. Uh, they have not found villagers that I'm aware of since that point. They had, I think, some samples last year that were questionable, but I have not ever seen the final report for that, so I really can't speak to it. But um, part of the testing that they do besides the microscope is they'll do a, a DNA type test, and our labs do this too 
and um, we're not finding anything in any of our reservoirs in northern Nevada. Um, so basically what we're saying is the DNA analysis, uh, there were some positive results here and there in 2011 and 2012. In Dow samples have never been able to com confirm those results. So this DNA stuff is highly controversial to put it mildly. So, and we don't know. So we're just assuming Bright Patch and Lahontan Reservoir, we kind of put them on a watch list, we call them suspect. Because we don't know if there are quagga mussels there or not. We haven't found them, but to come out and say we don't have them would be pushing it too. So we kind of stay right in the middle and say, well, they're suspect, they're on a watch list. Because we honestly do not know. Now, just because you get a positive DNA test does not mean you have quagga mussels present, by any means. It could have been a boat that was at Lake Mead that came up months later and, and gave you a positive DNA sample. It could be all sorts of things. So, uh, they aren't necessarily correlated if you get a positive DNA to quagga mussels. So, it's very controversial. So the other thing that the decal funds, as I mentioned, a lot of these are federal grants and, and the match portion of those federal grants pays for decontamination stations. Now with the help of Nevada State Parks, um, these are seasonal stations mostly occurring in the summer, uh, Wild Horse Reservoir has a decontamination station. Wild Horse is in there because it drains into the Snake River Basin, which drains into the Columbia River Basin. They do not have quagga mussels in the Snake River Basin or the Columbia River Basin, and if they do, I can't even tell you how many zeros that number's going to cost them with their hydroelectric power plants in the Columbia River Basin. So the, there's a big push for us to, to keep Wild Horse Reservoir clean to make sure quagga mussels do not get introduced into that reservoir because of downstream users. Uh, Rye Patch Reservoir uh, and Wahatan Reservoir both tested positive, as I mentioned, for quagga mussels to your, uh, 2011. Uh, so there are decontamination stations set up there operated by Nevada State Parks. Um, there's, they are seasonal. They all check watercraft, both incoming and outgoing vessels, especially outgoing because if if Lahontan Reservoir is positive and somebody wants to go up to Boca Reservoir from Lahontan, they're better off to be decontaminated before they leave and then go up to Stampede or Boca or to another lake or reservoir. We're trying to limit the introduction, the movement of uh, aquatic invasives. Now, one of the very new programs in the last six months is we're offering free of charge uh, decontaminations at Lake Mead National Recreation Area. And if you've ever been there, it's a huge lake, very huge. And there are very large watercraft there. And it is infested with quagga mussels. In Nevada, that's where you primarily have them is along the Colorado River Basin. And I'll have pictures of that to show you in a minute. Um, so Endow, in cooperation with National Park Service and U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, are operating those stations down there. Uh, we're primarily focused on more watercraft that have been in the water two, three, four years, or basically we'll decontaminate anything that's been in the water over five days. So, uh, and new this year, you can't see it very well, but we're going to have a uh, two seasonal traveling rovers that will go around to various uh, lakes and reservoirs across the state, They're moving rovers, they'll have a decontamination station, go educate people about uh, aquatic invasives and offer free decontaminations. Now, here's our types of stations. Um, this bottom one is what's in operation at uh, Lahontan, Rye Patch, and Wild Horse Reservoir. These are portable units. They run, they recycle the water. They run about, right, right around $40,000 per unit. Uh, the water gets up to about 140 degrees. Um, this is what our rovers, the type of uh, decontamination station that our rovers will be using this summer. Uh, they'll be towed behind a truck. You can see there's two tanks, one for output and one to get to collect the water back up after a watercraft has been cleaned. 
These are the stations at Lake Mead National Recreation Area, and these cost uh, somewhere around $300,000 for these units right here. Uh, National Park Service paid for those units to be installed. There are three of them at Lake Mead, at the Re Lake Mead National Recreation Area. These are very high capacity, and the reason being is, this is the kind of boats you're getting at Lake Mead. You're not getting these little 20 foot, 25 foot, or 15 foot fishing boats. These boats are massive. And I know we have been decontaminating a lot of them that are like 50, 64 foot long houseboats. That's big. And they have a lot of systems. So anything that comes in, the, any water that comes into contact with these, a houseboat, they have showers where they're sucking water out of the out of Lake Mead and into the shower. So you have all these systems that have water from Lake Mead going through them. Those all have to be flushed to get rid of any quagga mussels that could possibly be there. It's a big deal. And I don't think that there is any place else in the whole USA that's doing this right now on watercraft this big. And for that matter, that uh, in this deep, uh, uh, like this right here, this is what happens. This is what, this is a typical boat that's been in the water. This is the prop from a boat that's been in the water at Lake Mead for, I would say this is probably about six months to a year worth of sitting, if it was just sitting, if it wasn't in operation. We go in, we clean all of these muscles out, and that's, they're, they're under the boat, and they just pile. They pile on top of one another. And that's what I wanted to show you here. So if you didn't get a chance to see this, these are, these are pieces of pipes that came out of Lake Mead. They were just put in the water. This is the pipe brand new. This is the pipe after two months, four months, six months. And you can tell this is why, this is why it's an economic disaster. You're talking hydroelectric plants. They have to go in at Hoover Dam and scrape these off the grid systems. They go in with scuba gear and manually scrape them. There's no control for this whatsoever. So that's, that's the push to keep them out. Quagga mussels are, and zebra mussels for that matter, which we don't have here, are our biggest economic threat and our biggest threat probably for the ecosystem as well. So I'm gonna pass this around. If you didn't get a chance to look at it and just kind of go table to table, it's pretty important stuff. And those displays are uh, pretty impressive. And every politician you can name has handled that piece, that one right there. <laughs> they always get their pictures taken. <laughs> anyway, uh, so a little bit more about quagga and zebra mussels. This is a USGS map. Um, so you can tell uh, this is a combination of quaggas and zebras. They started out in the Great Lakes. They came across by trailered watercraft, they're assuming, into the lower Colorado River system. Uh, Lake Mead got hit first. Uh, more recently, in the last couple of months, Lake Powell is now infested with uh, quagga mussels. And they are finding them from the dam at Lake Powell all the way up to, I think it's, bull, is it Bullfrog Marina or something? Clear up in the northern part. They, uh, they're of course, because water flows downhill, they're of course all in the California aqueduct and all in that area, all down here. Uh, as I mentioned before, Rye Patch and Lohontan, we consider uh, on the watch list or suspect for, for quagga mussels. So they're spreading, but if you look up here, there's nothing so far. And these states do not want them at all. And so if you cross over their borders with the watercraft, you're, gonna, you're probably going to get inspected, decontaminated. And if you're coming out of Lake Mead, it doesn't matter. They're going to give you the third degree because they do not want them. So anyway, this is a, a, just a map of a trailer watercraft coming out of Lake Mead. And it shows you how easy quagga mussels can be distributed. These boats were going all over the place. Most of the boats we find are going to California or Arizona, but we have a number of boats. They just had two, we just had two of them a couple weeks ago going to Wyoming. 
Those boats had been in the water at Lake Mead for several months, or several years. So you know that they're highly infected with quagga mussels. Now, I'm gonna switch gears a little bit from quagga mussels to New Zealand mud snails. Uh, New Zealand mud snails, of course, don't have the economic impact, at least here, that quagga mussels would have, but it's something relatively new that's uh, in northern Nevada, at least in this area. So this is a photograph of uh, New Zealand mud snails on algae. This is actually at Maggie Creek out by Elko, Nevada. Uh, Maggie Creek flows into the uh, Humboldt River Basin. These are first detected by NDEP uh, in their routine um, macroinvertebrate sampling. Now, uh, here's 1980, New Zealand mud snails from 1987 to 1995 were fairly, they were, they were localized primarily in the Snake River Basin and that was it. Uh, some down here, uh, Lake Mead has them, that area. But Nevada really didn't have very many. Since that time, however, in just the last several years, um, they have been found at the Salmon Falls Creek area. They've been there for probably 20 years, I would say, 15, 20 years. Uh, Maggie Creek is relatively new in the last couple of years. Beaver Dam State Park is also in the last couple of years they have found New Zealand mud snails. Lake Mead has been there, they've been there for quite a while. And the newest one is the Truckee River in Reno. And those were just uh, isolated again by NDEP and then Endow went in and, and did a more uh, comprehensive survey to find out the extent of the infestation there. Um, and excuse my language here, the, the, I can't believe I did that. But <laughs> um, anyway, I should have put a dash or something there. But basically, how are they spreading? Uh, we think, once again, watercraft. Watercraft is moving a lot of things around. Uh, they've been documented on for quagga mussels, but also New Zealand mud snails, weeds, things like that. Um, contaminated waders and equipment, we think. Uh, felt soles on waders because they have so many little pockets that can hold very small critters and and fishermen go fishing here and then they go fishing someplace else and even rafters and people like that some people even say pets you know when your pet goes swimming in the river and you take them to another river they can have uh, invasive species on them uh, some people want, wonder if wildlife is transporting them I have not seen any strong scientific evidence for that though you can tell New Zealand mud snails they're small this is a rock showing they cluster a little bit. Um, not as bad as quagga mussels, though. Now, their preferred habitat, uh, they, they like lakes, like Lake Mead, and then um, they also like slow rivers, but the Truckee River isn't necessarily slow. They're all along the sides of the Truckee River, primarily. They can burrow, you know, they can go under into the sediment. Uh, what kind of problems do they create? They create <coughs> clusters. Not as bad as the quagga mussels, though. You can't control them, once again, for the most part. The chemicals you use to control them, you're going to wipe everything else out. And so prevention, and that's what we promote, is prevention for all this stuff. Uh, one of the big things, they can pass through a uh, fish's gut, basically untouched, and go out, and they're asexual. So if a fish swims upstream 10 miles, and secretes it, you've just introduced yourself to New Zealand mud snails upstream. Okay, from in Reno, they're going from, uh, this is the survey from last year, Mayberry Park down about to McCarran. And what's one thing that's very confusing in the Truckee River is we have a very similar species that's not an invasive, it's a native species. And this is it right here, you can tell the difference because the opening, the opening of the New Zealand mud snails is on this side. This native species is right here. So if you're out there sampling, this gives you an idea of the size difference. I, I like these photographs. <laughs> They're very small, but they can cluster. And of course, our main message is to clean, drain, and dry, which uh, there's information back there on it. 
uh, hot water will work to get rid of them freezing and this will work also on quad muscles a lot of invasives has specific gear for specific areas and elimination of felt sole waders or clean them very very well we have a new video online if you get a chance about clean drain and dry it's not an academy award winner but uh, it was our first shot at it so any questions i think i'm out of time <laughs> any questions do I have to give away for stuff? <laughs> <laughs> oh, where, do you, where do you get the decals? Uh, the decals you can buy at the Andow offices. You can buy them 24 7 uh, online or over there's a phone number, toll free, toll free phone number you can call. If you do it online or over the phone, you do have to pay a processing fee, I think, of 2 or $3 per decal. So you're better off to go to an NGL office and get them. How do you, how do you know if they've been checked or not? How? The watercraft? Yes. Um, if, a, if a watercraft's been completely decontaminated, like at Lake Mead, we put a seal around it. Uh, Tahoe does a similar thing. You put a seal around the the trailer that goes up around the boat, and if you launch that, that seal breaks. Right. Then you would have to be inspected again. Yeah. Okay. Now Tahoe's program is separate from this program. What? It's it's run off separately by TRPA. Okay. But the same concept over the whole Western states. If we only do a partial decontamination, we don't put a seal around it. We give. We always give the owner paperwork, though, okay. because if they get caught transporting and they have done nothing, right. they're going to get in trouble by some state, somewhere along the line. If they at least have paperwork that said, hey, I'm trying, they're not going to get hammered, probably. That answered my question about, you know, you get down the road and you think you've done what you can to do that, clean, uh, you know, all of um, and then you, you get caught as well, the quagga muscles you can. Yeah. Yeah, a lot of the stuff you don't know. We don't know. We don't know. And that's why they look at when you cross over into California, they want to know is your, your drain plug pulled? Are you wet inside where you pulled your drain plug? If you're wet inside, you're not clean, drain, and dry. So, and, and things like quagga mussels, even after you do a massive decontamination of Lake Mead where, where the boat can be covered with them, we cannot get all of those off. We can kill them, but it doesn't matter. California will quarantine you or reject your watercraft even if they're dead and they find them on there. That one example you had, where you were all over the, the houseboat, uh, mm -hmm. um, did they just reject that as No, we end out that that's what end out started doing is we provide that free of charge down at Lake Mead and it, it takes uh, it can take three people three days about to get, get them off. Pardon me? The, the boat operator the no, historically they were getting charged by the marinas. Uh, I think it was about $125 an hour. Uh, houseboats, of course, like I said, are taking days and days and people were not decontaminating so that's why Endow came in to assist with that to try to um, offer them for free to see if that increased the compliance of people okay so far yes we've got to move on i'm sorry if you have more questions you can talk with karen separately <laughs> thank you so much karen She's with the Nevada Department of Agriculture, and she's going to talk to us about um, invasive species mapping with a program called EdMaps, uh, which is what we are supposed to be using, and you'll learn more about it now. All right, hi everybody, my name is Jane King. I work with the Nevada Department of Agriculture um, in the Noxious Seed Program. I've been there about five years now, um, and we working on various <laughs> projects, the weed free certification, statewide mapping, just general education and outreach, and I also run our grants programs. So um, today, can everybody hear me okay with this? Okay, so today I'm gonna to talk about getting the map on the national map. Uh, EdMaps is 
a tool that we're using to get into that on the national map. And so I'm going to talk about that a little bit more. Uh, first, I want to cover why map, our statewide mapping challenges that we've had in Nevada in the past, and maps, and then the future for our statewide map. So first, I mean, this is usually pretty simple and most people realize why you should map, but I still have uh, local groups or landowners that are trying to convince, you know, we should be mapping even though going out to maybe control or inspect uh, it seems a little more important or pressing. Mapping is really something that's going to help us in the long run. So it allows us to show where and how large the problem is. For invasive plants uh, or invasive species in general, this is usually Nevada's biggest downfall for invasive, invasive plants because we can tell them the impacts, we can go out and show them an infestation you know, in their local community, but we don't have a map to show truly how large the invasive plant infestation is across the state or across all the western states. <coughs> Monitor treatment success, this is another big one. Um, you know, we want, you want to be able to map so that you can show, well, this year we found uh, you know, X number of acres, and after two years we have less than that. Track infestation reduction of spread, that's the same thing. And then create a log that anyone can understand without talking to you. This is another big thing with maps, and especially since I'm relatively new um, you know, in our program, is there's old data, but it was never put on a map with, a, with an actual scale that told me what the species were. You know, So it's just like a bunch of dots that are all the same color. So again, yeah, that has invasive plants. But that person's long gone now. And so that map, you know, really, if you make a good map, you should be able to communicate your mes message no matter who you're talking to. And then I like this quote. It's, um, a picture is worth a thousand words, but a map is worth a thousand pictures. Because again, now with our technology, you can have pictures connected to your map. And then your map can tell you a lot more than, than um, even sometimes reading a long document can. So our statewide mapping challenges. Um, first, for Nevada, there's been a lack of people collecting data. Like I said, especially when we talk about invasive plants, so in our noxious weed program, we have a lot of people that we want to go out and treat the weeds, uh, and not a lot of data is collected. Then uh, we have a wide variety of data collection techniques and data formats. So, like I said, we have some data would come into our office, and we've been trying to make a statewide map. And some of it's really good, really usable, I can see everything. And then some of it is uh, you know, a piece of paper with some X's on it. <laughs> this, is, this is the data. And so we have a wide range, depending on where you're talking about our data formats that we get. And then also, just from our state office, we have a lack of staff and overall time. All of us have a lot of things to do. And usually mapping sometimes gets lower on that priority list. So and maps. Uh, I guess probably about four years ago, our uh, office started getting involved with EdMaps. And now we look at it as the answer to some of those challenges. It's an online mapping tool of invasive plant distribution. It's actually set up to do all invasive species. So when you go on the website, which is edmaps.org, you'll see it it's set up for all invasive species. But they started with invasive plants. So you'll see more information, especially for the western states, uh, it's more centric on invasive plants right now, but they do plan on expanding it for all invasive species. <coughs> it's one database for both local and national data. Uh, again, this gets us to getting the map on the national map. One of the big reasons why we've gone forward with EdMaps is because some of our federal sponsors that are either out of regional offices in Utah or back in D.C., they're looking at this tool because they have other states that are using it. And when they look at Nevada, they're like, Nevada's doing pretty good. Well, that's just because we don't have data in there yet. <laughs> so <laughs> so um, EdMaps is that tool to both look at data on a local level, but then also a bigger scale. Uh, a lot of other states, and we plan on using it for a good early detection and rapid response tool. This could be at the state level, at a regional level, and then even on, on a watershed or county level. Uh, it's set up to where you can receive alerts when new uh, species of concern are reported in your area. Uh, and so, for example, Montana, just this last year, they don't have Medusa head, which is one of our bad invasive grasses. They got an EdMaps report from somebody that was from Utah hiking in Montana. 
of Medusa Head, and it turns out it was Medusa Head, but it was only about 10 acres. They're out there, I'm sure, nuking it multiple times now. Um, but it was a good tool. They would have never seen that before without having just a random hiker <coughs> record it to them. And this website, it was de it's developed by the University of Georgia, Center for Invasive Species and Ecosystem Health. And they started it in 2005, and um, like I said, probably in the last four years has really been when Nevada's been trying to get more and more involved in it. And the creators, I should say, they're very, very, I mean, I have the gentleman's cell phone, and they're very easy to get in touch with. So for Nevada, we can ask them, hey, you know, we noticed that you guys have some invasive species on there, but we're really interested in making sure that we can report on X. They'll change things for us, or however we can kind of fit our needs. They're really open to that. So again, it's at nmax.org, um, and it's an open public database. Useful capabilities. Uh, first, you can look up information on invasive plant species. So you can just click on, there's a toolbar on the top, invasive plants, and then it will tell you, just like if you were looking at, say, Calypsi or Bugwood, it, it corresponds with all of Bugwood's uh, pictures. So there's a lot of good information there. You can see current distribution of invasive plants. This is, like I said, uh, in the last couple of years, some of my federal sponsors were like, oh, well, Nevada doesn't have very much of X plant. And I said, well, that's because you're looking at something that doesn't have all of our data. But they are using it. And so they're using it at a big scale where they can look at distribution on, you know, across the entire West. Uh, but you can also look at distribution maps on a local level as well. You can download data in a variety of formats, so Excel formats, shapefiles. Um, you can also get data from here. You can report a sighting online, and you, like I said before, you can create an alert for reports made near you. And then you, collect, you can collect data using smartphone apps. This has been really handy, I guess, in the last two years. We, um, Tina Mudd, before she left, she made sure that we put in some funds so that Nevada is included on that smartphone app. And so it's up and running now, and to be honest, over the last year, usually when I find my GPS unit that's you know, under the seat without batteries in it, uh, I just turn to my smartphone, because everybody usually has a smartphone on you, right? And uh, it'll do the same thing as a GPS unit. <laughs> so for the app, if, everybody, if anybody has a smartphone, feel free to uh, follow the instructions here. You can search apps for Edmaps West. Uh, you do have to make sure that you search Edmax West. Uh, I got a report from a landowner that you do not search weed, weed maps. We get something completely different. <laughs> um, so Edmax West, it's free to download. Um, it's pretty easy. You can collect data without the GPS unit. You don't have to have cell service to be able to collect data. And you don't have to have an internet connection once you load the app. Um, you don't have to have internet connection on your phone to be collecting data. And then it's available for iPhone and Android. So this is what it looks like, the, um, the little icon there for the app once you download it. So this is what the main screen says, um, what it looks like. They categorize this again this is for all um, invasive plants, but they are expanding it, uh, and depending on which state you're in, you'll see an icon for invasive species, invasive aquatic species. Uh, it's just that there, are, since Nevada is a little slow on getting on board, we're focusing on just plants. And this handy as well because it's not just noxious weeds. Uh, our program obviously we're you know very work closely with the noxious weeds, but it includes any invasive plant. Uh, this is what a, the species list looks like. You can type in common or scientific names and it'll come up with a long list as you're typing in. And then you just hit the species that you're interested in. And like I said, there's a lot of different, um, just if you're looking at all species, like you'll see on the left here, the longhorn beetle. Uh, I know that there's some bark beetles that are already in there that you'll see when you start searching. Once you click on a species, this is um, some of the information that comes with the app. This is an example of some of the pictures that they have on there for Canada thistle. And it is handy as well because there's usually for every species five to six different pictures of 
of all the different parts of the plant, so it's handy when you're trying to identify in the field and you don't have your books with you. Uh, and then it does give you uh, identification information, uh, like how long the leaves are, etc. The species you're recording for it, once you're clicked on that species, uh, on the bottom there you would um, navigate to, to get to the recording form. Uh, on the recording form, the handy things are you can attach a picture, you estimate, you add in your infestation size, and then you can add in additional useful information. Uh, usually the most useful uh, for us is, you know, tell us if you treated it, or was it treated, the phenology, you know, what, what growth stage was the plant in at that time. Uh, anything else, if it's more an obvious vector, we can ask new folks to identify that, you know, right here, the carbon river is going to spread, you know, that sort of thing. Um, and anything else that you think might be useful for folks that are on the ground trying to manage those invasive plants. Then you hit save, and um, once the report is saved, it goes into a queue if you don't have cell service, or you can set up the app to just automatically be uploading it into EdMaps. Uh, but normally, you know, most folks just have it go into your queue, and then once you gain cell phone service again, or if you tell it, then it uploads everything at once. Uh, like I guess that I just mentioned that point. That's the queue, that's what it looks like, and you would just have all your reports uh, there lined up, and then you can upload them all at once. And what's really handy for us, and this has really been a good tool, is anything that goes into EdMaps creates an automatic email notification to our office, and then also any verifiers that are in that area. So uh, because it's set up to be not only citizen science, uh, you know, a lot of citizen science folks could use it, hikers, bikers, you know, I go to backcountry horse and then ask them to use it. Uh, but then also agency folks, you also could use it. And there is a system for checking, making sure that we're not reporting we have a ton of a plant that we don't have, um, where every state can set up your own verifiers. And so I've asked a lot of the uh, invasive plant management local folks that are on the ground along the Carson River to all be verifiers at this time. Uh, so they would also get an email, and then on that email, you just click a, a link, and it will tell you all the reports for your county that you want to verify. Uh, and comes with any comments that it, that it got, and then also any other pictures that are there. And then also, with the verifying system, they'll sit there. If nobody gets to it, it's just not released. And then also, uh, in the comments, if you put, this is on private ground, keep private. Um, the verifier is instructed to check the private box so that then those coordinates aren't out to the public. You can see there was a report made for uh, the Carson area kind of thing. So that's the app. Uh, this is the EdMaps online, what it looks like. This is the home page. And again, like I said, they are, uh, most of the states, especially in the East Coast, they use it for all invasive species, but for the West Coast, you'll see a lot more of it is first dedicated to plants, and then they're slowly moving to all invasives. There in the upper right-hand corner is where you sign up. Uh, all it asks you is a name and an email, and you know, I've been telling landowners, if you want to be really mysterious, make up a name, we don't care. <laughs> you know, it's, it's as easy as you just have to have an email that it can link back to. This is what you also can report online, uh, and it has a similar form as the app. And on the top there, on the website, you'll see that this is the toolbar <coughs> on the top. And it is once you start uh, working with it, you'll see that it's not, it's not so hard to handle. And uh, in the back, we do have a laptop set up, I think, uh, with Carson City Corporate Extension, that has EdMaps on it now. So after the break, you guys can go explore it. And then I also have some handouts of just general how to, you know, if you wanted to look up a distribution app, here's the steps, you know, on the website. So report signings online, you would pick a state, the state that you're in, fill out the form, and then you hit submit. Uh, really all that it requires is that you tell it what the pest is and then uh, a location. But they also ask for a lot of more information just because the more information, the more useful to the land manager. This is all still part of the form. Uh, what is nice about the form that's online is you have the capability to drop a pin down on a Google Earth type map. So uh, this has been handy if you know, I'm at a park, I mean, I'm not working, and I notice it has invasive plants there. I go back, I can go online, and I can navigate, zoom in, go to that park, 
and then drop the pin down and it automatically populates the coordinates for you. Uh, this is an example of some of the presence absence maps that are on EdMaps now. Um, so this would show you the just ahead presence absence by county. And obviously the ones that are filled in green is where reports have been made. And then you also can get distribution maps uh, by points. And so this is an example of one of the Google Earth's distribution maps showing where the points are of the just ahead that have been recorded. And it all works kind of like Google Earth where you can zoom in, zoom out. Um, you're looking for the map, however it's useful to you. Uh, additional tools for NMAPs, you can manage and update your own reports, so that's kind of nice as well. Uh, they always stay in there for what you report, and so the next year you can go back and say, and delete it and say it was gone, you know, I got rid of it, or, um, you know, change the infestation size, that sort of thing. They all stay in there as your report. Uh, again, the creating e email alerts has been really handy. I know Margie and Carson, she's, you know, she has email alerts set up for her neighboring county so that she knows when a new species is reported near her. Um, and then you can do upload of bulk data, which is also nice for a lot of agency folks uh, that I know already have, you know, their own mapping system. They already have a big database of their own. You can do bulk uploads. Um, you can do bulk uploads by just attaching an Excel file um, of your points. So this is where that upload data is. This is what it looks like when you have your reports. Um, and again, you would just click on upload data and that's how you would get a bulk upload. And then you can data, download data from others. Again, if somebody marked it as private, you would get those coordinates. But um, you could get stuff that was made public um, you can get coordinates, coordinates of things. And then you can access other training and mapping tools under EdMaps uh, as well. There's a lot of good, um, other states have put up PowerPoints about EdMaps, uh, about mapping in general. There's data collection sheets and that sort of thing. So our future plans with EdMaps is, um, you know, this is really handy, especially if you just want to get a quick point data map of where things have been uh, reported. But for our statewide maps, it's not quite, you know, I don't, we're not going to go pass out uh, Google Earth point maps, right? It's not quite the level that we want to be at. Um, and so what they'll do for us as well with EdMaps is they'll, and we're starting to create it now as an EdMaps GIS. So they will customize it per state. Uh, we tell them all the data layers that we want. And it's, and it's basically an online GIS database that will always be up to, up Updated with EdMaps points. Uh, so this gets our office to that point of being able to create professional maps, but not actually, without having an actual GIS person, which our office doesn't have. Um, and once we have this developed, we'll be able to share that link in the login with other lead folks across the state. Um, so again, it just repeats, this is a more complex database where we can also add in polygons, create polygons, measure points, and then compare where our weed infestations are compared to other layers, um, like fires or whatever else we want to have. So right now it's in development, and we should have it done by fall 2014. Uh, but the one caveat is we need more data. <laughs> so uh, you know we've been doing presentations asking folks, please put in that data to EdMaps. It's our easiest way to start sharing data so that we don't have a computer that's just sitting there with shape files. So is there any other questions? Any questions for you? Yep. Just curious, um, your verifiers, so you said you were going to do it. Um, are the verifiers uh, like the CWMAs? Yeah, so we, um, other states, are, you know, they already have weed districts in every county, so those are their verifiers. So any counties that have a weed district or a weed program, they're a verifier. And then any active CWMA uh, that has a coordinator, they're also a verifier. Okay, just curious because identifying plants can be difficult. Yeah, I'm yeah. I'm wondering so, how many false alarms you got. Yeah, well right now we haven't had that many people using it. Uh, last year was our biggest push to ask people, and then this year for sure. So um, really we haven't had a big overload of stuff that needs to be verified. And a lot of what we've been getting is, yes, I know that perennial pepper weed is in Washington County kind of thing. You know, so it doesn't take somebody to go out and identify that plant yet. And then if we got something that was more specific, 
kind of box though. I would love to talk to Sierra Club. Yeah, um, we, you know, like I said, this year is our first big push to talk to them where we can. But yeah, that would, that would be great if you had contacts. I would be really good. Yeah. Anybody else? Okay, so thank you very much, Jacob. Every step I'm taking 
Every move I make feels lost with no direction. My faith is shaken, but I, I gotta keep trying. Gotta keep my head held high. There's always gonna be another mountain. I'm always gonna. I'm taking. Sometimes I knock me down, but no, I'm not breaking. I may not know it, but these are the moments that I'm gonna remember most. Yeah, just gotta keep going. Thank you.